Hello and a warm welcome to all of you to the second part of our COVID-19 webinar series from Draeger. Today is Thursday, the 18th of June, 2020. And uh, yeah, it's already 12 o'clock. So um, I would say we start with the webinar. <clears throat> Before the official disclaimer, the webinar presentation is for information purposes only and has no commercial background. Gregor has neither influenced the content of the presentation nor taken editorial measures. The sole responsibility for the content of the presentation and the webinar lies with the author. All views expressed for information given are those of the author and are in no way attributable to Gregor. Before we start, please be reminded this webinar will be recorded and will be then shared later on. Regarding audio check, I would please you to shortly raise your hand so that I know that um, you can hear me properly. Okay, that's fine. And regarding question and answers, um, please see the uh, question field on the right side. All questions will be answered by the speaker at the end of the presentation. And in case we run out of time, all questions will be addressed to the speaker and will be answered afterwards. And with that, a warm welcome to the second webinar with the title Different Phenotypes and Approaches in COVID-19 Patients. My name is Harald Börner and I'm the Responsible Marketing Manager for Intensive Care in Dräger in the region Europe. This is the second of the COVID-19 webinar series organized by Dräger in order to spread knowledge on the topic of mechanical ventilation in COVID-19 patients. You'll automatically receive a copy of today's slide and link to access the recording in the next couple of days. But please be aware, you can only receive the slide and link for data privacy reasons. You must have clicked the opt-in link when you first registered. This is very important. Please be aware of that. So you got an email from Drager with the subject, just one more step, please confirm your email address. If you have done that once, then everything is fine. As you know, this is a webinar series. So we already had the first webinar last week with Professor Braselli, and this is recorded. And we will have the next webinar next week with Professor Navalesi. If you are interested in that, please have a look at the link below or at the QR code. And uh, yeah, we would be very happy if you uh, watch the recording or if you as well join the webinar next week. And with that, I'm very happy to introduce to you our speaker for today, Dr. Luigi Camparota. Dr. Luigi Camparota is an intensivist at Guy's St. Thomas and is at NHS Foundation Trust. Um, and this is one of the five ECMO centers in the UK. Dr. Camparota is the clinical lead for severe respiratory failure and ECMO services at St. Thomas Hospital. I'm very pleased and very happy to have you here, uh, Luigi. And yeah, with no further words, I would then hand over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Harry. Um, hello, everyone, and thanks very much for joining. It's a real pleasure to be here. And I'll um, try and uh, share my screen in a second. Uh, hopefully, that will work. Yes. Can you all see my screen? Looks good. Excellent. So um, I'll start to think sort of different phenotypes and ventilation approaches. So one um, thing about epidemiology, I think is quite important uh, given the, the magnitude of the problem and the fact that about 20% of hospitalized patients and about 70% of critically ill patients will develop with COVID-19, will develop an ARDS-like uh, pathology. 
But you can see that from the triangles that the proportion of patients who then received ventilation uh, varies quite dramatically within the case series. And similarly, the ICU mortality. Now, I put together a sort of all these studies that I could find in the literature, and you can see that there is a wide um, um, variability in mortality of completed episodes, and also the fact that some of these uh, patients uh, have been, or reports, have been published at different times during the pandemic. Now, for example, just have a look at this graph. These are data from, our own, from my own institution, and you can see patients who died, the proportion of patients who are discharged alive and the patients who are still in ICU. So if we take a cross-sectional uh, or point prevalence at this point, you can see that there is a still a large majority of patients who are in the ICU versus the ones that discharged alive versus died. And as you can see, this proportion will change over time. So we are likely to see different type of outcomes uh, in the next reports, and I think better ones. And the, similarly, you can see that what the type of respiratory support the patients receive uh, varies widely. You know, this is invasive mechanical ventilation that varies from 21% of the entire cohort to about 90% of the entire cohort. Equally variable is the prone position at, and the ECMO. So I would like to say that perhaps, you know, some of these outcomes might be due to the timing of, in, of, um, uh, uh, of reporting during the pandemic, but perhaps also the way we ventilate or our understanding of that mechanical ventilation of these patients uh, might contribute to outcome. And I'd like very, very briefly just to review the traditional model of ARDS, and you can see that essentially what you see is an increased permeability that causes edema, usually because there's a first insult in infection, for example. The lung becomes heavy, full of edema, therefore it collapses under its own weight, creating atelectasis. The lung that is residual and ventilatable becomes small. There is an increased dynamic strain and so on and so forth until a ventilator-induced lung injury causes the vicious circle. And therefore, we have two uh, main um, targets for ventilation. One is due to the small ventilatable lung, and therefore we try and use low tidal volume. And the other one is PEEP and recruitment maneuvers. And I'm going to show you in the next slides how this is very different or might be very different in COVID-19 compared to traditional uh, or typical ARDS. And in what way is different uh, COVID-19? First of all, in typical ARDS, the uh, respiratory failure or the onset of respiratory failure is very fast within the first seven days of an insult. This one, we all know, we have experience that it takes much longer, about eight to 15 days from the insult. And then there is a dissociation between, between radiology and symptoms. So the radiological injury can precede the symptoms, and I'll show you some data later on. There is a dissociation between the degree of hypoxemia and the dyspnea. Hypoxemia and loss of lung volume, so the lung volume is generally preserved, and the degree of hypoxemia in the response to PEEP. And I'll uh, show you some data throughout this presentation. So first of all, this is a data, uh, a study that was published in the Lancet um, a few, a couple of months ago, where there is a um, a group of patients who received CT scan at different stages of their disease. Now you can see that even in the pre-symptom stages, so when the patients were virtually asymptomatic, they still there were some CT changes. And over time, they go from a unilateral to a bilateral distribution, from a multifocal to a diffuse. The amount of ground glass goes down over time and its place is consolidation. And if obviously progressing, that consolidation will become uh, more fibrotic changes. Now, but this is what I think what is interesting and what distinguishes COVID-19 from the more typical all-cause ARDS, which is the vascular changes. So these are the 
this is a, a CT scan. You can see in the circle there that the, the, some of the vessels are quite dilated. And over time, that dilation leads to a sort of a more peripheral constriction with new uh, infiltrates. And if we look at dual energy CT scan data, what they show is essentially you've got two types of pathology. One, this is perfusion in yellow here. You can see the vessels are very dilated there, uh, whereas in, uh, um, in other areas, the, the ventilation is, uh, re the, the perfusion is reduced, and you can see that in red areas of vasoconstriction. And this is, has been um, also shown in a recent uh, paper published by Ackerman et al. in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, and you can see that what they found in post-mortem between COVID in, um, in red, maroon, uh, in influenza and in controls, what you can see is that there is endothelial injury, which was associated with COVID-19, which was nine times greater than in uh, typical influenza ARDS. And that was in terms of thrombosis and new vessel growth. You can see the new vessel growth is much higher compared to the influenza. And what is also interesting that these angiogenic features increase over time in the COVID-19, whereas remain static uh, in the in influenza. So there is clearly a angiocentric pathology, uh, endothelial injury, which leads to ischemia, thrombosis, and new vessel growth. And this is pathogenetically is uh, related to the uh, ACE2 receptors, you can see which you know is the receptor for the SARS-CoV-2, uh, which then gets internalized. And therefore, the metabolism of angiotensin II is reduced. And as a consequence, the angiotensin II levels increase, which leads to vasoconstriction first, and the angiotensin 1-7, which is more vasodilatory, goes down. But over time, things change. And obviously, there is an ACE1 receptor that is sh uh, shedding, which leads to a temporary increase in angiotensin 2 um, with inflammation and coagulation. And then secondary, there is a reduction in the angiotensin 2 levels, which leads to more vasodilation in the lungs, but also systemic vasodilation. Now, this is also data from JAMA, uh, uh, where you can see that there is extensive coagulation and inflammation with uh, clots within the microvessels of the septi, the small arterioles, and the medium-sized arteries. And on the right-hand side panel, you can see in the Lancet um, a study that shows essentially that markers of inflammation, um, uh, such as interleukin-6 and ferritin, and markers of immunothrombosis like D-dimers, uh, are increased quite substantially and preferentially non-survivors versus survivors. So clearly the, the pathology is within initially within the vessels. And clearly that is micro vessels, but there is a higher incidence of thrombosis. You see a large pulmonary embolus there. And in our case series, uh, these patients with COVID-19 got much greater proportion and propensity to develop uh, peripheral DVTs, PEs, uh, and uh, infarction compared to the non-COVID cohort. And you can see quite substantial differences there. Now, the presentation is very different. You go from the left-hand side, where there's just grown glass peripherally, uh, but the lung volume is pretty spared or preserved, all the way down to uh, loss of volume and uh, large edema. Now, this is quite interesting. So this is data from the ARDS task force uh, that created the Berlin definition. And you can see there that as the uh, pathology, the, the oxygenation defect uh, gets worse from a mild, moderate, severe, in yet, um, you will see the categories here, the lung weight increases. Uh, so therefore the, the amount of lung edema increases and the sham fraction increases. 
Now, on the right-hand side, these are data again from the New England Journal, from the Ackerman post-mortem data. You can see that in COVID, uh, sorry, that should be the COVID-19 is in yellow. The lung volume and the lung weight is much less than the uh, H1 and 1. So clearly there is a difference between edema and oxygenation. And therefore this has led uh, to the um, um, understanding that perhaps the mechanisms that cause hypoxemia, so you can see here, for example, two, pa two patients with the same degree of hypoxemia, uh, but so for the same PF ratio, but you will realize the very different pattern of consolidation and lung volume. And therefore, there is a, uh, the idea that perhaps there are two uh, non-exclusive, but certainly two ideal phenotype, which we called phenotype L and H, and I'll explain a little bit more in detail in a second. So with that in mind, we've got, just to recap, we've got an hypoxemia that now is caused primarily from a dysregulated pulmonary perfusion, and the lung mechanically has a low elastance, so high compliance, low VQ matching, the recruitability is low, and the PEEP response is low because there's very little lung edema. So the, the, the target for uh, PEEP is actually not there at the beginning. Then obviously the reduced perfusion of the lung causes also a uh, defect in gas exchange and particularly dead space. And then with time, there is more peripheral edema and pulmonary edema, which leads to collapse and ARDS-like. And this is a very different picture. So what we have are the two phenotypes that can change over time. And what I would like to say that as the lung consolidation increases, these two um, phenotypes are certainly not binary and certainly not mutually exclusive, but they are meant to be an illustration of how things change as a consequence of the pathology, initially perfusion uh, to parenchymal, and how the treatment and time can influence these two phenotypes. And this is a study that essentially showed is exactly this concept, shows that there is a, a number of patients, about 45% of patients, that present primarily with consolidated lung, and about 55% of the patients so that where the consolidation is less than 25%, but there is a large proportion of patients in between that represent a transition state or a um, uh, or overlap phenotypes. So we came up with this idea to have a, a way of managing these patients that takes into consideration phenotypes, particularly the lung volume at the bedside and the recruitability at the bedside. So first of all, we look at shunt fraction, just using the amount of FiO2 that is utilized. Then we look at worker breathing and, and the assessment of the risk of uh, patient self-induced lung injury. Then we calculate or we assess the strain, so the tidal volume in proportion to the lung volume or the FRC. And then we try and do broad characterization in the two phenotypes based on a arbitrary cutoff of compliance. And then we think about uh, assessment and um, early detection of failure and therefore escalation in care. I'll show you later on. So the first question is, what shall we do first thing? And obviously there's been great debate uh, um, uh, along this particular decision point. And what I would say, there are certain considerations. Obviously there is an infection control consideration. Different hospitals and different nations have taken a different approach uh, to this. Uh, the type of support required, particularly the effect on worker breathing, the failure rate, whether or not hypoxemia is reversed, and the tolerance, which is quite important. Then take into consideration the duration of this disease. This is not a disease like pulmonary edema that lasts a few hours or a few days. This is a, a duration that is more prolonged, sometimes a week. Uh, sometimes longer. So the pathology might not decrease or might increase over time. So these are considerations to be made in terms of the 
support that we uh, that we uh, provide, and also um, uh, resources, also in terms of ICU bed staffing the types of ventilation that we can um, we have available and the supply uh, of oxygen in the hospitals but what two three things i was going to say one is consider the use of uh, non-invasive support perhaps in patients with less severe uh, disease this is a uh, data from the lung safe on the left hand side and you can see that patients who received uh, non-invasive ventilation uh, compared to invasive ventilations when the PF ratio was less than 150 or 20 kilopascal had a survival that was inferior to the ones who received invasive whereas there's no difference when for milder disease so this is quite important the severity and on the right hand side is data from the Floralis study in the New England Journal that you can see the risk of intubation the risk of mortality is higher for non-invasive ventilation compared to oxygen by high flow. And also um, the failure to rescue. So the failure rate of non-invasive ventilation is quite higher in patients with de novo respiratory failure. And COVID-19 is clearly a de novo respiratory failure for the vast majority of our patients. And you can see that some of these patients have a higher failure rate and also they have rescue intubation later, which leads to a delay in intubation. Now, if we do provide non-invasive support, I think there are a few things that we need to monitor. One thing is the tidal volume. You can see that higher tidal volume uh, per kilogram of, of predicted body weight, uh, above 9 or above 9.5, depending on which study you look, they're associated with great risk of failure of non-invasive ventilation. And you can see here, uh, you can see this is um, the use of non-invasive ventilation uh, for strong evidence conditions. And as we move away from uh, strong evidence condition, the, uh, uh, the risk of failure from non-invasive ventilation increases. So we need to be careful about that. And equally, regardless of which modality of support we use, a delayed uh, recognition of failure and delayed intubation increases the risk of mortality and cardiac event and reduces ventilation free days. So one of the things that's been employed world, world, worldwide, and we've done it as well, is the use of a wake uh, proning, for example. You can see this is a small letter, but it's an interesting one as well, that shows that essentially the PO2 increases, but then goes down at the end of the prone positioning. And the same thing if prone positioning the wake is used with a non-invasive support. You can see there is a good increase in, in saturations and PF ration, but most of the time it goes back to baseline uh, after the deproning. And that points to the fact that there is a redistribution of pulmonary perfusion rather than necessarily recruitment of the non-dependent lung. But the other thing that I think we need to look at is the uh, worker breathing. Uh, some of these patients have a large worker breathing and incredible respiratory drive. And I think perhaps the angiotensin too might have an effect on the hypoxic drive, for example. You can see this is esophageal pressure and some of the patients have incredibly high esophageal pressure swings. You can see this is a study that wasn't done in COVID-19 patients, but you can see some patients who received non-invasive ventilation for um, um, hypoxemic respiratory failure can have huge uh, delta esophageal of 34 centimeters of water. But why is this important? Because if non-invasive ventilation is able to reduce uh, the swings in esophageal pressure, this is linked to NIV success and otherwise it's linked to NIV failure. But if you look at the bottom here, the, 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 the uh, graph in number four, you can see that if there is a change or an improvement in delta esophageal, there is a radiographic improvement. And otherwise, if there is a deterioration or worsening of the delta esophageal, 
there is a radiographic uh, deterioration. So I think they are linked to a concept of ventilation-induced lung injury. And this is the point. So the point is that there is an impaired gas exchange, the lung elastance goes up, the respiratory drive goes up, that causes an increase in transpulmonary pressure in tidal ventilation during non-invasive ventilation, for example. This will increase the capillary leak through trauma and also increase transpulmonary flow. That leads to fibrin deposition and lung edema, and that perpetuates the lung injury and maybe go from a phenotype to the other phenotype, which we've um, we've seen earlier on. And these are data, again, this is from animal model. You can see that as the injury progresses, the spontaneous breathing might have deleterious effects on pathology. And this is the idea. The idea is that uh, was put forward uh, in this um, perspective when he says that lung protective ventilation is uh, um, should be considered perhaps prophylactic in some of the patients to minimize the self-inflicted lung injury. And this experience has been taken forward by some of the experience that's been published from the Wuhan physicians. And you can see that they use um, high flow nasal cannula, non-invasive ventilation for a very limited period of time for a trial of up to two hours. And if there is no benefit, they progress to intubation. And this is what they say. They say that um, 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 large percentage of patients who then got intubated late, they died, 86%. And this is what they are concerned. They are concerned that some of the patients who they consider silent hypoxemia uh, might be delayed uh, in the intubation because it gives a false sense of well-being when oxygen death has been actually and asymptomatically increasing. And this has been summarized in the review, the management of critically ill patients COVID, where you can see very clearly a severity dichotomous uh, variable, so 150 or more than 150. And if it's less than 150, they, pro they proceed to intubation. And if it's more than 150, they do a trial of non-invasive ventilation or high flow, looking at exactly what I mentioned earlier on, spontaneous breathing, and hypoxemia and tidal volume in the non-invasive ventilation. And, um, and only in the case where everything is um, um, improving, particularly the worker breathing and the low tidal volume indicating low effort, then they progress with uh, maintaining non-invasive of high flow. Now, this is say something that's similar with employed, but then obviously when the intubation happens and mechanical ventilation, um, we start with initially with a volume control ventilation and we start with not super low tidal volume. You can see there eight mils per kilo, uh, modest peak, about eight, and then we measure the driving pressure. And now I'll, sh I'll explain in a bit why that is. And if the driving pressure is less than 15, that indicates that the lung volume is preserved and the compliance is preserved. Therefore, we maintain tidal volume at 8 mils per kilo. But if the driving pressure is uh, high, that will indicate that the compliance is quite low and the, the lung volumes are reduced. In that case, we move more towards ARDS indications where the tidal volume is reduced to six, six mils per kilo. Now, why are we happy initially to start at eight mils per kilo? Well, first of all, you can see there have been many trials comparing seven to 10. And when the patients don't have severe uh, ARDS or the lung volume is not reduced, you can see there is no reduction or no change in outcomes when we compare this to um, intermediate versus low tidal volume. And there is less hypercapnia, less need for paralysis, and less, less need for renal replacement therapy. Plus, 
we know from that study, uh, from the AMATO study in 2015 in the New England Journal, that provided the driving pressure. So the, the, the tidal volume divided by the compliance, essentially, uh, uh, which is an indication of strain, is low. The tidal volume and the plateau pressure have less of an influence in terms of the cumulative survival. Uh, so that's what we do at the beginning. And then we start the stratification based on phenotypes. And we use the compliance of 40 because that was initially one of the criteria, proposed criteria in the Berlin definition to classify patients with more severe ARDS, with more severe disease. So we use that cutoff um, as arbitrary as might be, but there was some physiological rationale. Um, and uh, if the compliance is high uh, or greater than 40, in that case, we maintain the same low um, P uh, settings. And we got clearly early into prone position, preferred into prone position. Whereas if the compliance is low, uh, then it's more classical, more typical ARDS like, where we try peep titration, if necessary, uh, uh, short recruitment maneuvers, and then prone position. And so this is 75% in our intensive care have this phenotype. Uh, and um, um, we use also lower tidal volume as per the ARDS strategies, whereas 25%, about one in four, have persistent um, L phenotype with low elastins. They're prone responsive, but not peak responsive. And um, in those patients, as we were saying earlier on, we use a more liberal tidal volume because lower tidal volumes often <clears throat> increase the dead space. And there is some evidence in the literature <clears throat> causing that and might affect blood flow. <clears throat> and we've got some animal data uh, saying how in low recruitable lung, actually high peak will just redivert blood flow from areas of, of, of um, 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 ventilation to an area of less ventilation, therefore increasing uh, dead space and sham fraction. And this is one of the uh, studies was published by uh, Tommaso Mauri that was in critical care. A small number of patients, but interesting physiological data where you can see that the uh, idea of recruitment is quite variable. They've used at the bedside the, uh, the methodology using the recruitment inflation ratio. Any ratio that is above 0.5 indicates a recruited or recruitable lung. But you can see that the variability is quite wide. You go from non-recruitable to extremely recruitable. But what you can see is what happens when the PEEP goes from 5 to 15 is that the compliance actually goes down. The plateau pressure goes up quite dramatically. The, uh, although the PF ratio increases, you can see that the dead space increases much more, causing hypercapnia. So indicating that the dead space seems to be the predominant factor in uh, COVID-19 uh, compared to the recruitability of these patients. And then this is some, uh, sorry, this is some, um, uh, references if you would like to know a little bit more about recruitment inflation ratio uh, this uh, the Lu Chen uh, is explains how to do it in normal conditions and the PAN um, study uh, will show you how to do it in uh, COVID-19 so in reduced resources but this is quite interesting. You can see um, that when you when we use the recruitability uh, test in uh, COVID-19, you can see that 83% of this population was poorly recruitable. You can see a recruitment inflation ratio that is well below 0.5. And obviously this recruitment could be improved uh, after prone position. So I think that is important uh, in terms of the um, management that we provide. Now, one of the reasons one, 
uh, that uh, these patients might not be recruitable has to do with the pathology of COVID-19. You can see from this letter, which I think is very interesting, most of the pathology is an organizing pneumonia with fibrin balls, which is clearly not a PEEP-responsive disease. You can see bronchiolitis obliterans, which is again not necessarily, not, not a PEEP responsive disease. And this is from pathology uh, reports all over the world. There is an increased incidence compared to other pathologies uh, of acute fibrin uh, fibrinous organizing pneumonia, uh, AFOP, uh, increased numbers of microthrombi, intralveolar fibrin, and therefore a fibrin-rich pneumonitis. So slightly different from the inflammatory edema, which is very recruitable. And so perhaps one of the things that we can do at the bedside sometimes is try to understand what is the prevalent mechanism of the hypoxemia. So there might be a different stage of, sort of disease, as we said at the beginning, based on the relative increase or deficiency of angiotensin II and the swelling and the inflammation of the um, um, uh, endothelium. There's a predominant shunt with vasodilation. Usually the uh, dead space indices are not particularly elevated. There is little response to pulmonary vasodilators. And therefore, perhaps prone positioning might be a good idea. Uh, and whereas in other patients who, and low PEEP, whereas in other patients where there is predominantly vasoconstriction or reduced perfusion, uh, then some of the uh, dead space indices might be increased. Uh, it might be worth trying a trial of pulmonary vasodilators. And if there is an improvement, then is a more dynamic phenomenon. And then we continue perhaps some of the pulmonary vasodilators. It's also important to realize that uh, as we've learned from echocardiography studies and post-mortem studies, the right ventricle is quite affected in these patients, despite uh, not uh, um, uh, terribly increased pulmonary artery pressures. So th there, are, there is a mechanism at the level of the capillaries and the endothelium that clearly affects pulmonary um, um, endothelium, but also right ventricular function. And if there is no change with the vasodilators, then we can think of a prevalent thrombosis or a prevalent dysfunction which is not uh, dynamic in nature. And with consideration for heparinization or anticoagulation, uh, I think, needs to be made. And clearly, I would advise everyone to measure some of the markers, measure D-dimer, CRP, ferritin, PCT, and then consider at the time in use of uh, some of the steroids of immunomodulators. We've got data now from randomized control trials coming out and some of the more anecdotal observational studies. So um, I think it's quite important. Clearly, at some point, there must be a evidence of improvement or a um, review of escalation. And now one of the things that we've been considering is the definition of an ECMO candidate. And every country has different um, strategies and different escalation policies, but clearly needs to be reviewed and consideration for vino vino ECMO in these patients. So I was going to uh, just summarize in a slide saying that clearly Given the pathology of the COVID-19, at the beginning, there are vasodilatory uh, 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 and um, the primary target is capillaries and the vessels. So the lung volumes might be normal or well-preserved. The percentage of lung edema is uh, low, so the lung is not recruitable for that reason. Therefore, we tend to use low PEEP, uh, clearly the the target for PPC edema and is not there, using more liberal tidal volumes because the lung volumes are preserved and therefore the ratio between tidal volume and FRC is favorable and the strain is, tends to be low. Now, in the course of the, over time, clearly the, the lung volumes might reduce 
and it's a factor of time versus treatment where the edema increases and the lung may become recruitable. In that case, we might need to think about higher peak and lower tidal volumes because now the lung volumes have decreased and therefore the strain tends to increase unless we adapt to the tidal volume. And we can use driving pressure as a as a as a marker or any other measure of um, of strain and uh, and over time though unless there is resolution the recruitability changes again because then there might be some uh, fibrin rich pneumonitis there is there could be an organizing pneumonia or there can be fibrosis which it makes it less responsive to peep that in, in that case, we go back to a lower PEEP and again, lower tidal volume because the lung volumes are reduced. In any case, consider um, dynamic tests of uh, vasodilation, for example, with nitric oxide or some other pulmonary, inhaled pulmonary vasodilators. Think about the value and the role of immunothrombosis and the value of heparin and some uh, uh, steroids or immunosuppressants. Uh, and then obviously that is much more um, a consideration that goes beyond the lung mechanics, but has to be taken, the whole clinical picture has to be taken into consideration. And these are my sort of, sort of cold take home messages. I would say, this is my last slide, uh, that patients with COVID-19 and acute hypoxemic respiratory failure often present with profound hypoxemia. And I would say this is sometimes long-standing because the patients might not be aware of it. Uh, they've got unusually good compliance, at least at presentation. Things change once they come into the intensive care. They may have preserved lung volume, or at least comparatively preserved lung volume compared to, for example, other etiologies. We've seen the New England Journal study, for example. The respiratory drive is increased and that can lead to a injury. Now, this is point three is quite important because it's generated quite a lot of confusion and debate in the literature. Uh, sometimes there's this semantic idea of uh, early intubation. I would say monitor drive and think about avoiding delayed intubation, uh, which is a much more patient-centered uh, intervention rather than early per se. And then mechanical ventilation maybe should be tailored to lung mechanics, not gas exchange per se. And with that, I would thank you for your attention. Thank you. Yeah, many thanks, Luigi, for this very, uh, yeah, uh, very nice presentation. And um, as I'm looking to the uh, questions, what we are, uh, what we have received, and um, they are actually coming in. Um, here is one which I uh, would send to you um, because um, indeed it, it has more questions uh, in it than just one. So mm -hmm. I send that uh, to you. Please let me know if you have received it. Uh, okay, so the question is, how would you explain the effectiveness of oxygen therapy in um, L patients with the right to let shunt fraction so high? Um, well, some of the times is not effective, uh, um, but most of the patients with a certain shunt fraction obviously will respond, but most of the patients have sometimes 70-80% oxygen and they don't respond. So if the shunt fraction is so high as the um, um, one of our participants has said, uh, some of the times these patients need something else. It could be um, a wake proning, could be non-invasive support and often they need invasive support. So um, I can explain it only based on the wide distribution of ventilation perfusion uh, in these patients. Uh, but I can't explain why uh, in some of the oxygen might be more or less effective. Let's not forget that oxygen is a, is a, a, has effect in the pulmonary vascular tone as well. 
Um, so I think it's all a variable and dynamic phenomenon. Uh, and that what makes this pathology very quite fascinating for people who look after patients with severe respiratory failure. Uh, no one is the same as the other. Okay, um, that was, um, as you can see, that was the, the first one and the uh, second one and the third one um, in that question, uh, Luigi, um, is that? Oh, I received only one, sorry. Okay, in that there was uh, um, there was a second question and a third question. Uh, okay. This is... What was the second question? Sorry, I cannot see it. If you in uh, in the type L patients, the VA yeah. is high. You see that one? Uh, no, but that's okay. If you can read it, I'll uh, I will try and answer. Yeah. Okay. In the type L patients, the VA is high and uh, plus tidal volume up to uh, 15 to 20 milliliters per kilogram body weight. And Q is almost normal. Can you explain the low VA Q match in these patients? So let me let me have a look and see. Um, so if you think I can show you some pictures. Can you all see this? Yeah, um, so you can see here. Uh, now it's coming, yes. Yes. Yeah. So if you see this image, um, uh, you can see how most of the um, patients, some of the patients here, have increased perfusion. There is neoangiogenesis, and therefore the, the perfusion can increase. Uh, and therefore might explain why. So you can see the ventilation and the lung volumes are preserved, but clearly there is an alteration in perfusion through vasodilation in neoangiogenesis. And that what uh, sometimes can put together this, I agree with the listener, it's quite, um, sometimes feels contradictory, but this is the type of pathology that's got an effect on the endothelium. Uh, and most of this pathology, I'm sure there'll be more and more studies trying to elucidate, uh, but uh, that is the hypothesis. Okay. And the third part of that question um, was, how do you calculate the shunt in COVID-19 type L patients? What if it is not shunt and it is a drop in hemoglobin oxygen affinity? Uh, well, um, well, thank you for that for that question. Um, we have um, not seen any, so we analysed about three hundred and twenty-seven patients. We have not seen any change in hemoglobin levels, and some of the data that we've uh, uh, one of my colleagues has published so far have not seen any change in hemoglobin affinity. Now, we are at the moment doing a study on uh, about uh, 16,000 samples uh, and compare it with the a historical cohort. We'll see what that shows, but there is definitely not significant right shift in the hemoglobin uh, affinity. Okay, many thanks for that answer. Next question, uh, sir, can you tell if there is any benefits for keeping patients in APRV mode of ventilation? Well, I was just saying one of the things about this uh, pathology in a way is that you'll need to adapt based on the timing of presentation and, and, uh, and essentially the lung mechanics. So if the lung mechanics is favorable, then you can, you can keep them on APRV and they'll respond well. Uh, the, the only thing is that some of the other patients might not. And in the case you need to adapt and do some, uh, some of the calculations of um, uh, recruitability and just clinical assessment. So I can't, unfortunately, I can't tell you how long to keep them on APRV. We've got patients who uh, start on APRV and stay on APRV for the entire length of stay, obviously with weaning level of pressures, and other patients who just need a low peep and just a normal, normal ventilations. 
and others, there's no matter what you do, they remain hypoxemic until the inflammation and the vascular injury results with other treatments. Okay, many thanks. Um, and here is a question. What is your view on management of the early compliant phase post-intubation? They often have huge tidal volumes if allowed to breathe spontaneously, even with no pressure support. Any risk of S -A -A -S -I -L -I here, um, I take overventilation, find that may need it. Yes, I, I, again, thank you very much for this question. So I think they are very important questions that we all struggle with on a day-to-day -day basis. I would say that some of these patients uh, have an incredible respiratory drive. You can see that although they might not look in distress, they generate quite substantial transpulmonary pressures. So if we measure esophageal pressure, for example, or even if we measure P01 on the ventilator, and most ventilators have got P01 maneuvers that can be done automatically, we can see the swings are enormous. In that case, that particular patient uh, that breathes with high uh, tidal volumes, those tidal volumes might not be might be harmful uh, because the transpulmonary pressure is quite elevated. So in that case, sedation and control of the transpulmonary pressure is what I would suggest. But some other patients have a drive that is better controlled, and the tidal volume just represents the fact that the lung volume is normal. And therefore, in that particular group, I would be less concerned. So my message would be to realize whether the the, the tidal volumes are dangerous or not. Um, at the very minimum, uh, measure the, the P01 or an occlusion pressure. Even better if you could do both with a transpulmonary pressure. But the very minimum, P01 in every ventilator, an occlusion maneuver, it takes two seconds, can be done with any ventilators. And then you can see the real uh, transpulmonary pressure. Okay, thanks, Luigi. Next question is, do you monitor esophageal pressure in all intubated patients? How about spontaneously breathing? Yes, so actually, you know, uh, again, thank you for that, because, again, we don't, we do just do in some patients, unfortunately, not routinely, um, particularly in the COVID-19 situation when we, like every other centre and every other country, we've been overwhelmed with the number of patients. So from a staffing perspective, equipment, et cetera, might not be that feasible. It might be more feasible now that we enter in a different stage, but that's a separate matter. Uh, I would say going back to the spontaneously breathing, exactly in the spontaneously breathing, I think is where most of the value is. Because as we said earlier on, if the transpulmonary pressure, the swings in esophageal pressure is elevated, those are the patients that are at risk and we need to manage them differently. I think the ones that generate very low tidal volumes are probably less of a problem or the one in, in the, uh, in mandatory mode because we've got years of experience with ARDS trials and we know how to uh, what to look for and how to manage is the spontaneously breathing patients that poses them at the greatest um, um, uh, challenge. Yeah. Many thanks. Um, and here we have a question regarding um, low tidal volume. Low means how low tidal volume? Um, how much uh, oxygen per kilogram body weight? Um, I think two in one. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so as I was saying, so if you measure your um, driving pressure, so essentially in um, at the beginning when the patient is intubated and paralyzed, you can do a small, a short inspiratory hold. You measure your plateau pressure. Do a short expiratory hold, you measure your total PEEP, you take the difference between those two and that's your driving pressure. If your driving pressure is normal or, very, or low, so less than 14, let's say, uh, 
it's probably your uh, strain is okay, uh, just at the bedside. Whereas if that is increased, your tidal volume is too big for your uh, lung volume. So in a way, that's the way I would think about too high or too low. Now, if you want numbers in terms of mils per kilo of ideal body weights, well, the traditional one for uh, reduced compliance is six mils per kilo, but that is just a number that applies to most people, perhaps not to everyone, but it's a good place to start. But again, in patients with preserved lung volume, uh, you can start with slightly higher. But if the compliance goes down, then revert back to ARDS guidance. Okay, thanks. And here we now have a question regarding uh, recruitment. Um, how often recruitment should be considered? Well, <clears throat> I wouldn't. I wouldn't suggest uh, that. So in patients with preserved compliance and preserved lung volumes, and by that time, it just from a common sense perspective, when you look at a chest X-ray and you look at the FiO2 that patients is requiring, and you say, oh, it doesn't look like this chest X-ray should have so much FiO2, that means the lung volume is preserved, just to say in the very practical terms then uh, probably recruitment maneuvers I would not uh, suggest because, first of all, the transformary pressure increase will be excessive. We know that uh, the right heart is compromised in a, in a proportion of these patients and the um, amount of lung edema is not, is not excessive to be responsive uh, to recruitment. In the ARDS-like category, then you can do a short recruitment and then obviously uh, recruitments that are um, uh, systematic and repeated, I would not advise, I would advise against it. And that is based on the art trial as well. So if you need to do a test, do moderate, maybe 40 uh, for a few seconds, maybe 10 seconds, that should be enough to give you a sense or whether or not this patient is recruitable. But before you do that, I would suggest using the some bedside recruitment test, like the recruitment inflation ratio. I've, I put some references in my presentation, and if you, I'll uh, put them back here just very briefly, uh, and I'm sure they will be available later on anyway, once the um, uh, webinar, so you can see them there at the bottom. I'll give you some time so you can uh, you can make note of them. So I would do that before I, I jump into a more uh, um, vigorous recruitment maneuver, which will not be helpful. Okay, and uh, here we have a question regarding proning. Will yeah. you change ventilator settings after turning prone? Normally, it's a good question. Normally, we don't. So the ones we use prone position, uh, they normally, on average, just to give you an idea of our cohort of patients, about 320 COVID patients with moderate to severe disease, uh, the average peak is about eight to ten and then so we don't change in chrome position we'll just maintain the same um, and um, yeah okay thanks next question would you please say something about the role of dexmetasone in ARDS Yes, I mean, it's clearly very popular now with the recovery trial that just uh, sent a press release. Um, I can't comment on that top for obvious reasons, but I can tell you what we do in our hospital. We use methaprednisolone. Uh, we've used it quite early in the course of the disease. And uh, let's not forget that, as we were saying earlier on, most of the patients come to us in the intensive care. They've been unwell now for, on average, 10 to 15 days. 
We are also a supra-regional referral center and most of our patients have been to other intensive care before coming to us. So that adds time. Uh, and so at the beginning, we tried to wait a little bit and treat them with methylprednisolone later on in their stay. But now we, we are starting using steroids quite early. And in patients who have a an inflammatory phenotype, so very high ferritin, CRP, et cetera, we tend to use much higher dose of steroids, um, uh, like methylprednisolone, even one gram of methylprednisolone. And um, sort of our experience, although not in a randomized controlled fashion, is that most of these patients do improve uh, in terms of gas exchange and lung aeration. Okay, many thanks, Luigi. And uh, according to the time, one last question I would uh, give to you and the other open questions uh, we then can uh, go afterwards. So the last question would be, what PO1 level make you concerns for more injuries um, in, in brackets if esophageal pressure cannot be measured? Yeah, yes, great. Um, so normal is about two or three, so minus two or minus three. So some ventilators measure it as a negative pressure, as it should be, so minus two, minus three. And other ventilators measure it as an absolute pressure, so you might see two or three. So I think less than five is quite comfortable reading. I think when you go above five and certainly above 10, uh, the work of breathing is quite excessive. And then you must do something to reduce the PO1, certainly around that level, I would say around five. Uh, and sometimes uh, it's essential that we do that multiple times a day. So some ventilators, for example, you can set the automatic measurement of P01 every 10 minutes, 15, half an hour, or an hour, whatever that is, and then when you go around, um, you can check and see how the support, the sedation uh, has gone and whether you need to change anything based on the results that you see. But I would say normal be below five. Uh, some patients, certainly above 10, is a, is a source of concern. Okay. See. <laughs> okay. So, um, Luigi, many, many thanks for having you here uh, today as a speaker. Nice. And uh, it, was a, it was a great webinar. And with uh, this, I would close the webinar. And uh, like said in the introduction, um, I would invite you to as well uh, follow the recording what we did last week with Professor Graselli. And um, maybe you as well join the next week's webinar with Professor Navalesi. And with these words, and again, a very warm thank you to you, um, uh, Luigi. I will end the webinar. Many thanks and bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone.